Hi guys and welcome to part 5 on the law on security and credit transactions. Today we'll talk about the contract of real estate mortgage or REM for short. Okay? Now if you enjoy my videos and you want to see more, please hit the subscribe button. Please remember that this is only for educational or informative purposes only and is not a substitute for proper legal advice. It is also not a substitute for studying and understanding the law. Okay? That said, what is a contract of real estate mortgage? By a contract of REM, a person known as the debtor or the mortgagor in this case guarantees the performance of a principal obligation by subjecting immovable property or real rights over immovable property as security in case of non-performance of the principal obligation at maturity or its due date. Okay, so let's go to the characteristics. First, it's a real contract, meaning that it's perfected by mere delivery. Okay, now it is also a subsidiary and unilateral contract. And the cost of a mortgage is likewise the same cost as the principal obligation which it supports. Okay, now please take note that a real estate mortgage is not a transfer or conveyance of ownership over the property. Okay, it is merely a lien or encumbrance or a burden placed upon the property. Nevertheless, an REM creates a real right. Okay, let me just clarify, you know, there is a difference between a real contract and a real right. Real contracts are perfected by delivery and its opposite is a consensual contract which is perfected by mere consent. Real rights are different from real contracts. Real rights are those which are enforceable against the whole world, meaning without a definite passive subject, okay? As contrasted from personal rights which are enforceable against a specific person or a definite passive subject, okay? Usually the debtor, okay? So now, what is the effect of this real right? It means to say that REM creates real rights and therefore the REM attaches to the property wherever it may go. Okay? Since the mortgagor or debtor is given the right to alienate the property or transfer it to a third person and the third person may transfer it to another third person, that is to say that the REM attaches to the property with each transfer. Okay? The implication in turn is that the mortgagee may claim payment of the mortgage debt from the third person to whom it was transferred. Why? Because he is now the one who has the mortgage credit. Okay? As I said, since mortgage creates a real right, it attaches to the property and it transfers from person to person uh, uh, as soon as it is transferred. Okay? Now, to what does the mortgage extend? Of course, to the property itself. However, it also extends to the accessions, to the improvements, to the fruits and income which is uh, and rents which is not yet uh, received as of the time of the due date of the obligation. Okay? Now, we can go to the requisites of an REM. Okay? First, since it's an accessory contract, its purpose, okay, which is why we're talking about this, its purpose is to secure the fulfillment of a principal obligation, okay? So, what kind of principal obligation? Can past and present debts be covered? Of course, that's the purpose, no? Past and present debts. However, may future debts be covered? Uh, it, provided the parties so agree, they may contemplate future debts under what is called a dragnet or blanket clause. Okay, under a dragnet or blanket clause, this allows the coverage of future debts that may be acquired by the parties. No, The purpose is to allow continuous dealings without the expense and inconvenience of having to execute a new security again and again and again. Okay, provided the parties both agree, and then a dragnet or blanket clause is allowed. Okay, next requisite, the mortgagor must be the absolute owner of the property. Okay, take note of this because some questions may ask a scenario wherein the mortgagor is just a lessee or is an heir who is not yet the owner. 
So those cases should not yet uh, should uh, your answer in those cases should be that there is no real mortgage because the second requisite of a real mortgage is that the mortgagor must be the absolute owner of the property. Okay? Since he is the absolute owner, he is allowed to transfer the property to someone else and he also retains possession which may likewise be transferred in case he alienates the property to someone else. Remember, any stipulation preventing or forbidding the mortgager from transferring his property to someone else is void. Okay? Only the stipulation is void but the mortgage will still subsist and be valid. Okay? Uh, also remember no, what uh, properties can be contemplated in the contract of mortgage earlier when I discussed the dragnet or blanket clause I was talking about past, present, and future debts now let's talk about past, present, and future properties okay it, under the requisite that the mortgager must be the absolute owner of course the coverage is past and present well present properties no properties which the mortgager absolutely owns however may future properties be subject to mortgage as a general rule no okay however the parties may by stipulation they have to both agree they have to agree that even future properties or those that are acquired after the mortgage was created will likewise be subject to the mortgage lien. If the parties don't agree, then future properties cannot be part of the mortgage. Okay, next requisite, no? The mortgager must have free disposal or he must be legally authorized to dispose of the property. Okay? Fourth requisite, the object must cover only immovable property or real rights over the property. Again, these are rights which are enforceable against the whole world. Okay? And uh, finally, we have the uh, requirement of registration. Now, let's talk about this requirement of registration. You have to remember the general rule in contracts that the law will only require a certain form for contracts for validity, for efficacy, or for greater convenience. If the law requires a certain form for validity, then that requirement is absolute. However, in this case here, requiring registration in the registry of property, that requirement is not for validity. So even if you don't register the mortgage in the registry of property, the mortgage will still be valid. Okay? What is the effect? Now, if it's not registered in the registry of property, the only effect is that it will not bind third persons. Okay? The mortgage still exists and will just be binding between the parties to the mortgage. Okay? So, registry in the registry of property is only to bind third persons. Okay? Now, let's go to the kinds. There are three kinds of uh, real estate mortgage. Now, we have voluntary, which is entered into by agreement of the parties. We have legal uh, REM, which is created by uh, operation of law. And we have equitable mortgage. Okay? Equitable mortgage, we have discussed this, or I will be discussing it in another vlog under the concept of conventional redemption in the law on sales, okay? Equitable mortgage. What is an equitable mortgage? Just to review, it is one that lacks the formalities of a mortgage but shows the intention of the parties to treat the property as a security to fulfill the principal obligation. Okay, so how do we know if it's an equitable mortgage, no? The law itself give, gives us uh, badges of fraud. Okay? I'll give you some examples since that's not the topic today but uh, for the sake of uh, discussion such as when the price is unusually inadequate, when the vendor remains in possession or when the vendor undertakes to pay the taxes on the property or when the buyer retains part of the purchase price. Those are just some examples but there are other badges of fraud. Okay, In that case, even though denominated as a sale or a sale with right of repurchase under Pacto de Retro or conventional redemption, it will be treated as a mortgage under the concept of equitable mortgage. Again, because the parties really intended the contract to be one of 
mortgage. Okay? Now, let's go into Pactum Commissorium. Okay, I've discussed this on my uh, episode on pledge, no? but it is also important here in real estate mortgage. What is this pactum commissorium? Okay, it's a prohibition by law. It prohibits any stipulation allowing for the automatic appropriation of the property mortgage to the creditor upon non-payment at maturity. Okay? In other words, what is prohibited is automatic appropriation by the creditor. The creditor cannot automatically be the owner of the property upon failure to pay by the debtor. Okay? But if there are intermediate steps taken, such as the public auction, we will be, which we will be going to shortly, then that is not a violation of Pactum Commissorium. Okay? Again, what the law prohibits is that the creditor will suddenly become the owner that is what is prohibited now in that case only the stipulation is void the mortgage is still valid and existing provided the other requisites are present okay now we can go to foreclosure okay what is foreclosure it is the remedy of the creditor when he subjects the mortgage property to the satisfaction of the principal obligation through a publication a public auction okay the applicant, he will now apply the proceeds of that public auction to the payment of his claim. Okay? In other words, the scenario here is the creditor was not paid the debt owed to him. Okay? Since he has a security in the form of the property mortgage, he will now undertake proceedings to foreclose on that property and sell that property through public auction in order to apply the proceeds to what, he, what is owed to him. Okay? Now, under foreclosure, there are two kinds. Okay? We have the judicial and extrajudicial foreclosure. A judicial foreclosure, as its name denotes, uh, entails uh, judicial proceedings. Okay? This is covered under Rule 68 in the Rules of Court, which I will not be discussing in depth. No? This is a subject matter for remedial law, which is my favorite, by the way. No? In any case, I'll just give you a few ideas. First of all, the court with jurisdiction is where the property is situated and uh, it is uh, initiated by the filing of a complaint, okay? And uh, the court will now determine the amount due and then uh, if it so finds uh, the claim of the complainant valid, it will now order payment through a judgment. After judgment, this is now where... Uh, what you need to know is important. Now, after judgment, the debtor or the mortgagor is given a period of 90 to 120 days within which to pay the amount in the judgment. Okay? Okay. In case the mortgagor or debtor fails to pay and uh, provided the, the sale the, the certificate of sale has been confirmed no, after, in the public auction, then the buyer at the public auction will now be entitled to possession of the property okay now uh, let's talk about the proceeds in the sale in case of judicial uh, foreclosure if the proceeds are enough there's no problem okay the debt is paid that's enough no but what if the proceeds are uh, in excess of the the claim of the mortgagee no if there is an excess the excess will go first to the junior encumbrancers or those who have uh, uh, less preferred mortgages, babayaran muna sila. But if there are none, then the excess goes to the mortgagor or to whom, okay, or to the person who mortgaged the property, no? Okay, but if there is deficiency, then the court will render a deficiency judgment, okay, and may hold the debtor liable for the balance okay take note what is being enforced here is the principal obligation so the person who will be held liable is the debtor and not the third person to whom the property was transferred okay okay now let's go to the second kind of foreclosure which is the extrajudicial foreclosure extrajudicial foreclosure simply means that it is uh, proceedings that are outside of the court however in order for this uh, power to be invoked, 
it must be contained as a stipulation, as a special power written within the contract of mortgage. Okay, this is governed by Act 3135. Okay, now uh, I'll just briefly go through the procedure. Uh, first, of course, you must file an application before the executive judge of the court. Then uh, there must be compliance with the requirements of posting of notice of sale, which must be for not less than 20 days in uh, at least three public places. And of course, in, the, in case the property, the value of the property exceeds 400 pesos, which is practically all, all, all properties now, no? If it exceeds 400 pesos, there must be publication once a week for three consecutive weeks in a newspaper of general circulation in the city or municipality. Okay? After those uh, requirements have been complied with, then we have the sale where there must be a bidder. No, The property will be sold to the highest bidder. Okay, and in case the sale uh, has been successful, then the, the they will issue a certificate of sale, which is uh, when the period of redemption will take place, which takes us now to the discussion on redemption. Okay, now what is redemption? It is the reacquisition of the property by the mortgagor or the third person who, who is now in possession of the property okay so uh, if earlier in foreclosure there were two kinds there are also two kinds of redemption here okay in case of judicial foreclosure we have the equity of redemption meaning uh, the mortgagor still has the opportunity to get the property back okay within what period either within the 90 to 120 days from entry of judgment or as long as it is before the confirmation of the sale okay again within the 90 to 120 days from entry of judgment or as long as it is before the confirmation of the sale and within that period the mortgagor may redeem the property sold at public auction However, there is a different rule, no? If the mortgagee is not a natural person but is specifically a bank, then the equity of redemption is longer. Okay? Why? Because the law seeks to give uh, more rights no, to people when dealing with banks, no? So, uh, in case the mortgagee is a bank in equity of redemption, the mortgagor may redeem within one year from the confirmation of the sale. Okay? So, that's it for equity of redemption under judicial foreclosure. Now, let's go to extrajudicial foreclosure which has the right of redemption. This is also contained under Act 3135. Okay, in the right of redemption, the redemptioner or the mortgagor has a period of one year, okay? One year from the issuance of the certificate of sale. And in order to exercise this right to redeem, he must pay the purchase price and 1% per month, no? As well as uh, applicable taxes and interest, if any. Okay? Now, uh, in case uh, of juridical persons, who are the mortgagors and the mortgagee is a bank, the period is only three months. Okay? It's less than if it's a natural person who is trying to redeem. Okay? So, uh, that's it for uh, the law on uh, real estate mortgage. I hope you have picked up a thing or two. I hope to see you again for my next episode on anti-crisis. Okay? Bye!